let's open a word of prayer as we begin. Father, we just thank you so much just for just the evening that you've given to us and just the beautiful day. And we just pray, to God, that, that you would just meet with us tonight. We just pray that as we sing praises to you and uh, as we learn more about you through your word and that you would just give us just the wisdom from your word and the application, dear Father, for our lives through it as well. And so we just pray that you just just take this evening, and I pray that we receive all the glory for it, and that we would be strengthened for it. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, we'll take a few favorites tonight. Is, is Alvin all right? They, they're they on vacation. Oh, uh, they still going? Mm -hmm. oh, okay, so you're going to be the music director? Yeah, that's <laughs> like the third string. <laughs> get what you get. <laughs> 314? Okay. More love to thee, page 
tonight. Okay. <clears throat> oh, that's it. Page one fifty nine. Blessed be the name. <clears throat> Isaiah chapter 5 tonight, and we began there last week, if you recall, and, <clears throat> and we're not going to go back through it again, but we, but verses 1 down to verse 7, if you recall from last week, 
uh, Isaiah changes gears here. Of course, he's sharing what the Lord gives to him to share. And he, and he uh, uses a parable in verses uh, 1 down to verse 7. And basically, the synopsis, really, of those verses was sharing with the idea. Because up until this point, we see that Isaiah is sharing with Judah. And in, in the end of chapter 4, the daughters of Judah, um, as far as what the judgments are going to be how everything's going to play out. But at the end of each chapter, we see how that he, God constantly gives the, the realization and also the promise that things will get better eventually. Um, but there's going to have to be judgment. And, we, and again, we've been saying that right along, but it's not God's fault because of the judgment. It's man's fault uh, because of their sin. And so... In chapter 5, verses 1 through 7, he gives the parable of, of, the, uh, of the husbandman and, and, the, and the vines and the vineyard. And basically the vineyard was representing Judah and how that he did everything possible to be able to uh, not only create it, but to sustain it, to defend it. If you recall, he talked about how that he placed a tower in the middle of it, and, and, and that was uh, sim, sim, symbolizing protection for it, and, and everything that could possibly be done, God had done for Judah, and that's really what the representation there was. And then as we come to the end of, uh, of that portion, and notice in, in verse 7 of chapter 5, he says, For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are his pleasant plant. He looked for justice, but behold, oppression, for righteousness, but behold, a cry for help. And so he, God had done everything. He had, he had shown forth his mercy, but man was not showing mercy even to each other, to mankind. And so this is what we see. We're going to see some more of that as we go throughout this chapter now. And we're going to uh, begin in verse 8. Let me go ahead and give you the... Um, the blank. So, <clears throat> so we we're in, on Roman numeral number three. God and Judah. On in your notes, A was the song of the beloved and his vineyard. Vineyard was, and that was through verse seven that we finished up last week. Uh, this week we're going to get through, hopefully, um, verse twenty-three tonight. That's the goal, and. B is the woes, W-O-E-S, the woes to the wild grapes. And that's going to be the portion here in your notes. And we'll be looking from really verse 8 uh, down through verse 23 in, in, our, in the text. And then we'll leave off there in 23 and pick up and finish up the rest of the chapter next week. Lord willing. What did you say, Justin? What was it said? Did you just say woe to what? Woes. W O E S is the blank. Therefore, B. Oh, okay. Woes is. Woes, and then the oh, one okay. before yeah, it was vineyard. Yeah, I got all that. Right. Woes is just a, it's a deep one. Correct. Yes, sir. Okay, we're done. All right. And um, so we'll begin here in verse 8. And. <clears throat> As we begin, and let's let's uh, read um, verses eight through ten here. As we begin, and notice it says, uh, "Woe to those who join house to house; they add field to field, till there is no place where they may dwell alone in the midst of the land." In my hearing, the Lord of Hosts said, "Truly, many houses should be des desolate." Great and beautiful ones without inhabitant. For ten acres of vineyard shall yield one bath, and a homer of seed shall yield one ephah. And so here into this, and, and we're going to go into some detail here with this. Um, here are a couple different thoughts here. Verse 8, 
uh, here where he says, woe to those who join house to house. Here the picture is of a greedy real estate buying and development. This is what's going on here in, in this context. Um, and notice here in verse 8, it says, woe to those who join house to house. They add to the field, so there is no place where they may dwell alone in the midst of the land. And here, this is what's going on. And, and at, in previous chapters, we see how that, how that um, Isaiah is talking about God's judgment is coming down upon, uh, he, he mentioned earlier on, and actually in the first couple of chapters, really talking about uh, the, the kings and those in authority and how they were being oppressive. And now you see the trickle down of that. We mentioned that a couple weeks ago where we had mentioned how that that's exactly how society responds. Um, you, you, you've heard the statement that everything rises and falls on leadership. And it's really true. And as far as even in government, we see that, don't we? Sure. We really are confused on that. Uh, we see that. We'll leave it at that. And, and we see that, that if you have a righteous government and, and they are obeying by law, we see things go well, right? And if you don't, <laughs> this would say we have what we have. And right. so that's where we're at. Right. And, and you see that. And, and through every, every stage of civilization, you see that. You see empires rise. But because of their, uh, number one, we would say their lack of the knowledge of God and the trust in God and relationship with God, and then from there, you see it, they, the society just becomes, be, be, uh, decays from the inside out. Mm -hmm. uh, we mentioned so often, but Rome is one of the, I would say, one of the greatest examples of that. Here we have a, uh, a nation that took over basically most of the known world. Mm -hmm. And but they, you can say, well, they just stretched themselves too thin. Well, then that's part of it and all that. I'm not going to know all the history of it. But the idea is, too, is they were also becoming very, but they had false gods, they had, everything was going against them. And then the debauchery, uh, the sinfulness of the nation, uh, they were just basically begging for God's judgment upon them. Mm -hmm. And really, in the end, we see how that it wasn't God that just came and just put hail, uh, hail and, and uh, fire and brimstone down upon them. But they basically decay from the inside out. Mm -hmm. And just like we've mentioned from time to time, I, I think one of the greatest forms of judgment that God can ever um, allow a people to go through is just letting them have their way. Uh, and he, if, when he removes himself. And that's basically what's going on here to a degree. Now, he's not casting them off forever, but he's basically removing his hand of protection. And that's what's going on here for them to be able to see, hey, it wasn't so bad under my rule, was it? And this is what we're seeing. And so notice here, and, and then as we say all that to say that as we come down to this, it's even, it's even getting to the point, it's not just the rulers, but the trickle down as we see that even the average people are now cheating. And they're uh, becoming uh, just as corrupt as the leaders. And we see that even beginning here in verse 8. Um, so here we see the picture is a greedy uh, real estate buying and development here in verse 8. Uh, Calvin said this about this portion. He said, for it cannot be condemned as a thing in itself wrong. If a man add field to field and house to house, but he looked at the disposition of mind, which cannot at all be satisfied. When it is once inflamed by the desire of gain. According, accordingly, he describes the feelings of those who never have enough and whom no wealth can satisfy. And don't we see that all around us in our world? You know, it, it, you can never have enough. You know, you can't just have one car. You've got to have more cars and, and people that are wealthy. And, you know, you can't just have one house. You've got to have, you know, a summer home. And you gotta have, and you get the idea. It goes on and on. People are just never satisfied, and it's not just the wealthy, by the way. Right. We see that just in, in civilization itself. Mm -hmm. uh, something as simple as even cell phones. 
Um, you know, we're, we're, we're looking around um, just because our, the service is, is just, anyway, terrible with our cell phones, but the, um, we're looking around at different other potentials. And the prices of cell phones, I, I couldn't believe it. You know, and, and what, what gets your attention is they say, well, you know, it's like $10 a month and you can, but it's like a thousand dollar phone. <laughs> and you're like, oh my goodness. So, and, and again, what, is that, what does that say? It says that people are just never satisfied. How does that get to that price? People are willing to pay it. And people are never satisfied. That's why there's a new one out every year, and if not every half year. And it goes on and on. That's just an example. But we see how that even in this, and this is talking about even with real estate, and we see that even going on today. Uh, I've heard that even in the, in the news, how that some of the um, prices of homes, the, of what they're going for now, as opposed to what, they, what they're even valued at, people get into these bidding wars, and, and they're going for even so much more than they even should be. And, and again, it just, it, we see that, and this is basically the same type of principle going on here. People just never satisfied and always take, trying to take advantage of someone else. Verse 9, notice it says, In my hearing, talking about Isaiah here saying, In my hearing the Lord of hosts said, Truly many houses shall be desolate, great and beautiful ones without inhabitant. And so here we see that in judgment, their real estate deals will not be successful. So, so God has a funny way of turning things on its head, doesn't it? And here, even in their selfishness and in their greed and in their taking advantage of others, notice here that the, the judgment in their real estate deals will not be successful and they will have many vacant and unsold houses. That's what's going on. That happened before too, Justin. They all had them, uh, stuff collapsed. Yeah. All in homes, they were buying and people couldn't afford them and everything. And, it, and what you just said, it's happened before. Yeah. Yeah, we've seen it even at times, even in our own lives, you know. And here, a little maybe different scenario where it's it's not just the market just crashes. This is individuals who are purposely trying to cheat other individuals, and the Lord turns it on its head, where they're the ones that end up literally holding the bag, mm -hmm. sort of, if you will, with the houses. Mm -hmm. um, an individual. Uh, Theologian by the last name Trapp said this, covetous persons are the dragon's temper who, who they say is so thirsty that no water can quench his thirst. Covetousness is a dry drunkenness, says one, an insatiable dropsy and like hell itself. And we think about that, you know, and going back to this text, that's exactly what man, uh, and, and, and really in the end, when you think about um, this type of greed and everything else. We talked about that last week, but it's because man's bent towards sin. Um, their whole life, their whole soul is really in and of itself bent towards sin. God created us with a, a love, a devotion towards him. And I would say even to the point of an insatiable um, love to where to where they couldn't get enough, and I truly believe whenever God um, met with them in, in the cool of the morning, the Bible says, and every time they had fellowship with God, it was the idea there that that they could never get enough of that, and I believe that's also how they were created. We were created for wanting more, but ultimately God created us initially wanting more of Him. And because of the bent towards sin, because of uh, sinfulness, it's now been diverted in, in towards our own uh, wants, our own desires, and our own sinful lusts and those types of things. So this is what we see going on. Um, and here, this is just, and by the way, this is just one way that it's played out. Uh, here we see they're talking about homes, giving that example. But this is just one way we see it played out. Yeah, but that's not just a lost man. You're talking about a Christian man, too, uh, bent towards sin. Yeah, yeah, it's a constant warfare. You know, the Bible talks about that. We're in a constant struggle uh, with the natural man and the new man, and we're constantly at war with one another. 
Um, and um, I believe that's why Paul, whenever he says that, he, he says at the end of the statement, oh, wretched man that I am, but he, he, first of all, he's talking about how that how that the things that he should be doing, he doesn't do, and at times the things that he should be doing, he doesn't do, and, and um, or vice versa. And and that's exactly the same type of struggles that we have at moments. Um, and uh, yeah, it's a, again, it's a, it's an on onward um, ongoing warfare. Notice there in verse eleven, as it goes on. Um, Uh, verse 11 there, he says, Woe to those who rise um, early, uh, or early in the morning that they may follow intoxicating drink, who continue until night, till the wine inflames them. Uh, here the picture is of those who work hard to party in an endless celebrating. Their lives are filled with substance abuse, and basically, we would say also, he talks about there, um, who rise early in the morning, they, they follow in touching drink, but continue to night to wine and flames them. And here we see how the, the, the abuse of alcohol, and um, you know, you see at times that, um, where you see that, that every, every time that they talk about actually intoxicating drink in the Bible, um, it always comes back to the reality of the verse that says wine is a mocker. And you say, well, you know, well, what's wrong with a little bit of wine? And I've had that conversation with many, many people over the years. And, and my, my comeback is this, you know, um, I think it's interesting how that whenever it gives the uh, commands for a bishop or a pastor that he's not given to wine for, for the elders or for deacons, it says he's not given to much wine, and, and I think that that can become a, a, a real point of conflict um, if you allow it to be, and I come back to this, is that um, why would you allow yourself the, um, to be put into that position of it becoming an issue? Anything is never an issue until it's an issue. Um, so, so why would you put yourself into that position? Um, what's wrong with sweet tea? <laughs> you know, and um, you know, and to me, uh, I'll be honest. I, I drank wine one time in my life, and I'm thankful I, I threw up, <laughs> and I threw up so bad that I was like, how in the world would anybody ever want to drink this? And I, I poured the rest of it out. From the, anyway, um, being honest. And, um, you know, and I'm thankful for that because, you know, that's at times all it takes, right, for some people. And you never know until you're there. Right. You know, an alcoholic doesn't start out as an alcoholic. True. Um, so the idea here is, is why in the world would you just even go there? Mm -hmm. And going back to the text here where he says, woe to those who rise early in the morning that they may follow intoxicating drink. And, and here... Here's the, here's the thing to be realistic about. He's dealing with intoxicating drink here. Is that a problem? Absolutely. But before we jump on the drunk, here's the thing. Really, what's the issue? What, if you break this totally down, what is the main issue even with intoxicating drink? It's that their mind is so miscued that their mind cannot be on their God. And that's like that with anything that we can say in this world. Mm -hmm. You can say, yeah, yeah, you should get on to the drunks. Well, here's the thing. What is it in your life, that in my life at times, that holds us back from our focus being totally staying on our God? Because for each one of us, the Lord, oh, no, <laughs> strike that. Uh, Satan had, uh, uh, is trying to put something in our lives to try to destroy us, to uproot what God's doing, and, and it can be anything. Be to money. Could be money. Could be money. Because right. people that work on Sunday and all they don't have to. Yeah. You know, and it should be in church and all. If we be trying to get money, but like you said, any kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And it's not in itself bad, but if it overwhelms you, right. it's 
not only I have to take a drink for the money, I need kind of a dozen in the family. Right. Yeah. That's preaching, ain't it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Correct. Yeah. Um, does that make sense, what I'm saying? Yeah. So, so when you come back, you know, and, and a lot of times, you know, um, maybe we don't just, uh, I don't know that I would just sit and do a whole message on, on alcohol. Um, but I would say this, in, in it, is that you can talk about good night, you know, alcohol, cigarettes, tobacco, you can go into all, uh, drugs, and, the, and really in the end, you really have to lump it all together. Why? Because all those different things impair our judgment and our focus upon who we should be focusing upon, who is that God. Mm -hmm. You see, we're just being super spiritual. You know, there's nothing wrong with those things in and of themselves as long as I'm over my body. Well, you know, again, why would we go there? You know, why would we make excuses for things? Um, and why would we just toe the line to the world instead of being as far away from it as possible? Why would we do that? Whenever we can be as close to Christ as we want to be. And so we see that. Um, that was good. I don't want to tell you, but that was good what you said. It's not just alcohol. I mean, you know, it could be other things. I mean, you're trying to go beyond just saying alcohol. You say it could be a lot of things. Right. Take, your, take your mind off the dog. Mm -hmm. We're not talking about that necessarily right now, but, but going along that line of being fair, you know, just like we would come down against homosexuality, we need to come down against heterosexual sins as much as the homosexuality. Um, because it's just as a a stench in God's nostrils as, as the homosexuality is. So it's, uh, you have to be fair. So it's, you know, and everybody, you know, if you're, if you're to preach a sermon on homosexuality, yeah, yeah, and, you know, but, you know, I mean, there's all kinds of sexual perversion in uh, heterosexual ways, too. Mm -hmm. that, and God's just as appalled. So we have to be fair about it. Right. Um, going on in verse uh, 12, here, um, so we have the picture of those who work hard at party and endlessly celebrate. And then in verse 12, notice verse 12 where it says, The harp and the strings, the tambourine and the flute and the wine are in their feasts. But they do not regard the work of the Lord, nor consider the operation of his hands. And then notice verse, and here in verse 12, we see how their lives are filled with substance abuse and we would say music. Now, is there anything wrong with music? I would sure hope not. We just sang three songs. But it's what is the music about? If it's sensual, if it's if it's if it's diverting our attention, our focus, our minds, our hearts away from God and onto fleshly things, then yeah, I would say that that would definitely hit God would definitely be appalled. And notice it's interesting at the end of verse twelve. Um, and Ann, let me stop here and say this: Is there anything wrong with the heart? The answer is no. It's, it's, not, it's not a hard one. Um, the tambourine. Is there anything wrong with the tambourine? No. Flute. No. A beautiful instrument, right? But it's how it's what it's played for, right? David in the Psalms played with most of these to Saul. And after the after the defeat of the Philistines, he danced too to the Lord. So really in the end, we see how that it's it's what is it played for? What's the reasoning for it? Where's the heart's desire towards it? And here it's for a sensual uh, way. And the biggest problem is at the end where it says, nor considers the operation, well, it says, but they do not regard the work of the Lord, nor consider the operation of his hands. Why? It's very obvious. They're drunk, so they can't. <laughs> That's really what it comes down to. Because notice, why in the world are they, does it say that, but they, are, but they do not regard the work of the Lord, nor consider the operation of his hands? Because their mind's impaired. Why? Because they're drunk. So, how in the world is that pleasing to God? Anytime that you ever see drunkenness in the Bible, it's never good. Noah got drunk. What happened with that, right? Uh, it goes on and on from there. Uh, so, drunkenness is never a good picture in the Bible. It never ends well. And here we see that even, and this is really actually I would say the biggest most important reason against it. 
is exactly what it says, but they do not, in verse 12, but they do not regard the work of the Lord. So that, to me, is the biggest issue uh, with it or anything else that would divert our hearts and our attention away from God. Um, going on. Uh, and, and, and the question could be raised, I wrote this down, the question could be raised, what is wrong with the party life and addiction into entertainment other than the obvious? Uh, simply put, God is forgotten. That's the problem. God is forgotten. Though men may claim to remember him in some way, they do not regard the work of the Lord, as this verse says, nor consider the operation of his hands, and anyone who really does regard the work of the Lord and really does consider the operation of his hands will live as if in uh, God is real and as if there is something more to life than partying and entertainment. We live in a world today where partying and entertainment is just the thing. You know, for young people, it's they, they idolize and emulate after these individuals who, that's all they do. But then if you look at the at Hollywood, just use them for example, and, and, and those people, you know, I, I was thinking about this the other day. Um, I was I, I read an article about um, one of the actors. Uh, I won't name his name, but um, about how that in each role, in one one role, he, he had to be kind of like overweight, and so they had to eat all the stuff to get overweight. And then in the next role, he had to, you know he he wanted to be like really ripped and everything else, and and uh, so they had to lose all this weight and go through all this training. I was like, can you imagine? Living that type of life, mm -hmm. where really in the end, I'll just be quite honest, it's a fraud. <laughs> all you are, and it's what it is, it's, it, what's the name? It's an actor. That's all you are. And yet these are the people that so many people emulate and pattern their lives after and everything else. And, and they're, you know, uh, living their life as, as they want, no thought to God, no thought to spiritual things. And it's, and it's really a travesty in, in, in this nation. And and, you, and, you, and this is exactly the type of lifestyle that we see here that's going on today, that in so many people's lives, unfortunately. Uh, verse 13, notice it says, therefore, because of, after he says all this, he says in verse 13, therefore my people have gone into captivity. Notice. It shouldn't be any shock, it shouldn't be any awe that, that this is happening. Why? Because the people are doing this. Can you imagine? This is interesting, you know, because uh, the, the, one of the places was, I think it was Savannah. Uh, we were down with my mom and dad's, and, and at the time she was, or no, I'm sorry, it was Kira. And, and she was like, and, and um, mom always makes this big spread every time we go down for every meal. And, um, and she had, and she made the comment. She says, "Oh, this is so so good. I don't get this kind of food at home." So like, you know, and I'm just like, really, you know. And Jennifer sitting there, you know. But anyway, um, and and if you get that picture, and 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 then bringing it home, you, you think about God and Him looking down. What of a smirch upon God that these people are at this moment? and an embarrassment to him to the nations around them. Here, this is the God of, of Jehovah God who, who they actually, they didn't follow him, but they actually reverenced him. They understood, you know, don't mess with them. They're God's people. But then here you see how they're acting. And here all of a sudden, then, and then and here's Isaiah saying, hey, you're going to be overtaken by these people. So now, God's people become a joke to the nations around them. We see a lot of that going on today, too, don't we? And here, you get uh, going into uh, verse 14. And well, in the end of their verse 13, he says, Therefore, my people have gone to captivity because they have no knowledge. Their honorable men are famished. And their multitude dried up with thirst. And, and notice, it not it interesting here how that he says, because I thought, as I was going through this text, I thought it was very, very saddening, tucked right in the middle of verse 13, where it says, because they have no knowledge. 
No knowledge of what? Or who? God. Why? Because they've been so uh, wrapped up in living for themselves, for the immediate, for the temporal, that they've given no place for God in their lives. And that, that's a real danger, even for our lives today. Mm-hmm. And again, we, we say this each week, as we go through these verses, instead of us just criticizing Judah, we need to pause and say, hey, wow, God, show, shine your light in my heart. Show me where I am coming up short. And that's exactly what we should be doing. This is what Judah should have been doing long before this moment. And he goes on and he says there at the end of verse 13, and their multitude dried up with thirst. Thirst for who? God. It was as if their soul was just parched. Come down to verse 14. Therefore Sheol has enlarged itself and opened its mouth, behold, beyond measure. Their glory and their multitude and their pomp, and he who is jubilant shall descend into it. That's some very sobering words, isn't it? And you think about our, our, our world today, and you think about how that there's so many, you know, that are just doing the exact same thing. You know, it's the party life. It's, and it's not just partying, by the way. It's just at times it's living the mundane life, but giving no thought to God. And what's happening? Uh, hell's doors are open. People are dying every day, going to hell. Because of their, uh, because of the lack of having a relationship with God. And here we see the same thing going on here in Judah. It started off where it says in verse 13, because they have no knowledge. And because of that, we see the downward spiral into verse 14, where it says, Therefore, Sheol has enlarged itself and opened its mouth, behold, beyond measure, their glory, whose glory, not God's glory, the people's quote-unquote glory, uh, and their multitude and their pomp, and he who is jubilant, those who are going around being drunken and everything else and partying and everything else going on, shall descend into it. Yes. That was good what you said, you know, being a preacher, to let us know we got to look at our own lives too, not just come down hard on them. Mm-hmm. It's hard for preachers to preach the truth, but that's what you said. We got to look at our own lives too, yeah. you know, because we. I mean, it's not just not to look at him say, and mock him. It's to look, and so, it, I mean, it takes, we're blessed to have a preacher that will preach the truth, not to be popular. Well, the way I look at it, too, is we're going to be judged for what we do with God's word. Every every preacher or teacher will be. Um, and I think there's going to be some, just like the, his word says, that there's going to be those who come to him in the last days saying, Lord, Lord, look at all the wonderful things I've done in your name. And those are some sobering words, too, where he says, depart from me, for I never knew you. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's going to be a sad day, isn't it? Mm-hmm. You come down to verse, so here, verse 14, he says, uh, verse 13, he says, Therefore my people have gone into captivity. Uh, those who forgot about God because of their parting and entertainment will be judged by a captivity that will end the lapse. And that's exactly what's going on here. In verse 14, where it says, he who is jubilant shall descend into it. Here, uh, and what's going to end up happening? God will be exalted. Even through the judgment, God is going to be exalted. The Lord of hosts shall be exalted in the judgment, it says, and the reward, and reward the meek. Notice in verse 17, it says, then the lambs shall feed in their pasture. Notice, you remember, if you recall, earlier on, in, in the book, he talked about those who were basically being trampled over by, uh, by the evildoers. Those would be what we would consider the sheep. Those who were innocent here. Those who, and by the way, there's always a remnant, thankfully, right? Uh, all throughout the ages, God has, has had a remnant of individuals who, who stay by the stuff, if you will. And here we see that even in verse 17, it says, And the lambs shall feed in their pasture. Why? Because God's removing all of the evil ones. 
And so therefore, he's in his judgment, and in righteous judgment, by the way, he's removing all this so that his people can once again feed. Feed from him, feed from his word, and then as we go along, and then in verse 17 it says, And in the waste places of the fat, of the, of the fat ones, strangers shall eat. And here we see the reward once again of the meek. Um, going along into verse 18 here where he says, Woe to those who draw off iniquity or sin with the cords of vanity. And notice what, notice what it's stating. He says, Woe to those who draw. Basically, you can get the picture. It's almost like somebody with, uh, with a rope pulling it to themselves. And it says, Woe to those who draw iniquity with cords of vanity and sin as if with a cart rope. So here he's saying, and, and really if you think about that, that's what the, the, the life of sinfulness genuinely is. It's just constantly pulling one sin after another to yourself. And why? Because it's vanity. There's nothing in this world that is... That, um, that, that will satisfy the life. That's why people that are, that are addicted, whether it be alcohol, whether it be sexual things, or whatever the case may be, why do they have to keep going back and going back to those things? Because it never satisfies. There's nothing in this life that satisfies. And that's what we see even in this verse. And, and, how, and how does he address it? He says, woe to these people that are doing this, that are drawing iniquity. They're not drawing God and, and trying to, trying to, if you will, um, follow after God in this same uh, endeavor, uh, this type, same type of way or the same type of mindset as far as trying to crave it to himself. It's sin instead of godliness. And this is the issue. And then he, and notice how he puts it. He says, draws iniquity with cords of vanity and sin as if a cart rope. Uh, here, they pull their sin to themselves with ropes of emptiness. And that's really what it is. Calvin said this, they, they flatter themselves by imagining that what is sin is not sin. Don't we see that today all around us? Right. The things that, they, that we say as believers and from God's word is sin, they say, oh, that's not sin. And then he goes on to say, or by some excuse or idle pretense, they lessen its enormity. And that definitely goes on. Because the least sin damns us to hell. It's not the enormity of the sin. It's sin in general that's what damns us to hell. Why? Because every sin is, is, a, is a flagrant violation of God's precepts. Um, then, then, the, then he goes on and ends by saying, these then are cords, wicked ropes, by which they draw iniquity or sin. And that's exactly what we see going on here. And this is what they're doing. They're bringing, you know, instead of God, and, and again, you, what, and, he, and I had to constantly remind myself, as going through this text, who is he talking about? He's not even talking about the, the, the heathen nations. He's talking about Judah. This is who he's dealing with. And this is what they are doing. And, and really, in the end, they're just inviting God's judgment upon them. That's really what we see, and that's really what they're going to get. Then we come down to verse 19. It says that they say, let him make speed and hasten his work that we may, and, and who's the hint? And notice that him there is capitalized. It says that, uh, that say, let him make speed and hasten his work that we may see it. And let the counsel of the Holy One of Israel draw near and come that we may know it. Here in this verse, um, it's basically saying that these, that these empty words, they show their arrogant contempt of the Lord. It is as if they are saying, go ahead, God, we're ready for your judgment. Because notice what, he's saying, what they say, let him make speed and hasten his work. What is the work that's coming? It's judgment upon them. You know, I think it's so interesting how that over the years, yeah, and I know you all have seen them too, you know, people 
talk about how that you know when they get to hell it's just going to be one big party, or or they see some you see cartoons just making light of it, you know, and the devil with the pitchfork, everybody's running around with a drink in their hand. That is not how it's going to be. Sadly deceived, and it's as if they're just waiting for the day. And the old statement, you know, there's nothing new under the sun. This is exactly the same mindset that, that Isaiah is describing of the people here. And notice, and, and notice, I think it's so sad because it's not just what might be said. It's in quotations. It says, that saying, this is what they're actually stating. Let him make speed and hasten his work. I mean, how dumb can you be? That you're calling down God's judgment upon you. That's really what they're doing. Um, I mean, it's just, it's sad beyond words. And he goes on and again at the end of the text here, verse 19, and let the counsel of the Holy One of Israel draw near and come. Again, just begging for it, if you will. That we may know it. And by the way, they're going to know it. God does judge them, by the way, and, and it's no laughing matter. And notice in verse 20, he says, Woe to those who call evil. This is a very familiar portion of Scripture here, verse 20. He says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Don't we see that today? Yes. You know, we're the ones that look like the morons. You know, we're the ones that are just the old fogies and, and the ones who are just, you know, not woke or whatever the case or the term you want to use today. And whereas they're the ones that are in violation of God's word and his will. Justin, do you think it's a lot like, do you think they might have been like a lot of people think today, it's a good God, a loving God, sure. but he's not going to do much? Do you think, I mean, I don't, I don't yeah. know. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because again, you know, who, who wouldn't want to follow after that God? You know, this grandfatherly, Sam Fuzzy type God. Um, who's just going to, you know, accept everyone in. And no matter who you are or what you did. You know, in the end, everybody's going to be forgiven and it's going to be grand. And that's not what we see from Scripture at all. Verse 20 there, he says, so again, he says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness. And you see that even in, even in even in how the sexuality today, how that they're promoting ungodliness, even in that. And then, the, and then the light, those of us who would say, hey, it's sinfulness, then we're looked at basically as he says here in the light for darkness. Basically, we're the ones that are looked at as evil. You know, those Christians, you know, they're just, and I guarantee you, I can just see it. You know, just like, just like in, in, World War II with, with the Jews, um, how that they were, it was, it was brainwashing, we understand that, but, but the thought of it is, is that I can see, you can just see it on the horizon, how that we're going to be ostracized like that, because of our beliefs, of being intolerant and everything else that goes along with that, and, 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 and really in the end, we're going to be the minority, but we're right. And it's not because we are right, it's because God's word is right. And it's because we're adhering to his precepts. So we're going to be looked down upon more and more as this age starts to, to wane right. towards the end. We're going to be looked down upon, I guarantee you, we're going to, there's going to be more persecution and everything that comes along with that. Um, and then notice in verse 20 says, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. And then verse 21, um, we're going to finish up here um, with verse 23. Verse 21 says, Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes uh, and prudent in their own, in their own sight. And here in this, in this verse, uh, these were men of accomplishment, of high achievement in sin. You know, you think about that. And there's a lot of people today that have got, you know, PhDs and all these things behind their names and everything else. But they're on the road to destruction, just like the pauper. And that, and, and, and this is what they're saying here. Notice he says, Woe to men, of, men mighty 
uh, or I'm sorry, verse 21, woe to those who are wise in their own eyes, but he says, and prudent in their own sight. But what's, what's the fill in there? They're not. Because, they're, it, because it, it really the answer is wrapped up in the statement. They're wise in their own eyes, but they're not wise unto God. Why? Because they're forgetting Him. These are people. They're not dumb. They're forgetting God. And they become fools in the end. And then we see verse 22. Woe to men mighty at drinking wine. Woe to men valiant for mixing intoxicating drink. You know, you see that, and, you know, these parties they have, and, you know, just how many can drink, and, um, you know, and, and uh, basically and chug down, or whatever the case may be. And, and notice, he even deals with that part of it. Woe to men, might get drinking wine. Woe to men, valiant for mixing intoxicating drink. And notice verse 23, but this will be the last verse we'll look at tonight. He says, who justify the wicked for a bribe, and take away justice from the righteous man. Exclamation point. And here in this verse here, and this is the last one we'll look at tonight, here under this thought, these are men who care only for their own pleasure and entertainment and care nothing for others. And that's what we see. And we see that again in our own world, all around us. And, and, and the real danger is, is being caught up in that. Um, I use this as an example. Um, and only because the Lord really spoke to my heart through it. Um, on Friday, we've been having issues with the Verizon people and all that anyway. We'll get into that. But um, the, the guy was out here and fixing our line. And um, so I went out and talked with him and whatnot. And, and I said, and thank you, you know, for coming out. You're actually supposed to be out here September 1st to do it. And so he was already out here and, and fixing it. And uh, so anyway, I thanked him and whatnot, went inside, and my dad had called, and I was talking to him for a few minutes, and then uh, we got my coffee and came back and through and noticed he was packing up his truck. And the Lord just really convicted my heart to go out and witness to him. So I told dad, I said, you know, I said, um, let me call you back, because I said, I've got to do something for a minute. And so anyway, he hung up and I went out and grabbed a track and one of our brochures from the church and went out and um, asked him if he knew the Lord as a Savior. And his, and his face just lit up. He said, yeah, I do. And he goes to a church over on the other side of Highland Springs and, and he mentioned the church and his whole family goes. And, and, and we really got to start talking about the Lord. Uh, he, he started talking about how to live with all the mess in the world and all the things going on. That it, it's he's he really struggles mentally with it, and and we just had a good time just strengthening one another. Ended up having prayer with him, and and I tell you, I came back in and just started crying. Just thank the Lord for that, and not necessarily just for the conversation, but for speaking to my heart. Because there's so many times that mm -hmm. I find myself just. Lost the horizon guy, you know? And so many times we, we do that. True, true. And just pray that God will break our hearts. Right. To have, as one preacher put it, not to just see people as trees walking, but as souls. True. And so here we come back to this verse 23 where he ends and he says, And take away justice from the righteous man. Here's these individuals who are who care nothing about it's only about themselves, their own desires, their own life, and they're not caring one iota about anyone else around them. And again, before we come so hard on Judah, we need to come back and pause and say, you know, before we say, wow, they're about to get their comeuppance, we have to pause and, and ask our own selves, where am I in that? How do I look at opportunities that the Lord places? And I believe every day he places opportunities before us. Right. And it's what we do with them. Mm -hmm. Do we respond to them? And guess what? There's not always going to be, you know, a lightning bolt out of heaven to hit us that you didn't do this. But I'm thankful at, 
at moments for the Holy Spirit that I believe that convicts our hearts to say, hey, you know, this is what you need to be doing. And, and realigns our minds and our focus and our attention back to where it should be. And, and here we see a whole nation that had forgot this reality at this moment. And here we, we've got, even though he wasn't popular, no prophet ever was, we should be thankful for a man like Isaiah, that even though he wasn't popular, here he came with basically a message of doom at this, and judgment at this moment. But it was absolutely for their good. And it was also showing that God is a just and holy God. He demands our love. He demands our, our devotion. And rightfully so. Why? Because he's our creator. So as we close here this, this, this evening, and we'll pick back up there in verse 24 next week, trust that the Lord will just use, these, use his word as we continue to go through it just to um, speak to our hearts, break our hearts, and make us more of the servants that he wants uh, from us. Let's close in a word of prayer as we want to get into our prayer time. Father, thank you so much, dear God, for your word. Thankful for how that you convict our hearts and you speak to our hearts, dear Father, through it. And we just pray, your Father, just continue just to do so uh, each day. Not just when we meet collectively, but each day as we read your word, that you constantly, your Father, just uh, convict us, your Father, as, as we need it. Pray you also strengthen our hearts. We live in a world that does not love you. At times we can become um, so overwhelmed at moments and uh, thinking at times that we're just uh, just a band of few. And really, in the end, we are. But, but as, as people are marching uh, the wrong way, we're the ones who are going to be looked at as fools. But ultimately, we realize that we're still pleasing you in our lives. And if we're still following after you, that's all that matters. Your word says that it's going to be broad as the way to destruction and narrow as the way to heaven, and few there be that find it. So we pray, your Father, you help us to be as pilgrim ones and pilgrims of progress, faithful uh, to the end. We ask these things in your name. Justin, I just thought about something. Mm -hmm. most, most every one of us in here, somebody had to tell us about Christ. Mm -hmm. And so he's expecting us to go. And, and he's going to do the work. We just yeah. need the vessel. Right. But that was true. And so you had, you were so testing. And it worked out. You didn't know Christ. And you encouraged him. You don't know how much you encouraged him. But, you know, and I'm saying, but it, you could have did what you wanted. He didn't make you go. But that's what I'm saying. That's why the Lord will use you and write my way. Because you're beating me. Well, he uses each one of us that way, too. Yeah. As, as we are. That's right. All right. Um. In our, in our list, we'll, we'll run down through. Um, if, if you have any updates to anyone as we go through them, just raise your hand and we'll, and we'll make note of those. Um, <coughs> Bill uh, Mitchell, uh, he's still in a lot of pain. He had the, uh, that procedure with the cement. He had that yesterday and is hoping that the pain will merely, uh, is merely from the procedure and will dissipate in the days ahead. So continue to pray for him. He's still a lot of pain from it. Um, I know Terry had talked to him too, and um, and he was just saying how that the he's in more pain now than he said that he's ever been. So, which that's a lot of pain. And so continue to pray for Brother Bill, if you will. Uh, also, we have on there uh, he has an MRI on September the eighth to check for any bone infection. Uh, and then the orthopedic surgeon said that Bill could have the hip surgery as early as late September or early October, praying and trusting the Lord that there's no infection. And also, he's supposed to be going back, um, I believe it's the 28th, um, to check on the hernia that he has, because uh, he's supposed to have hernia surgery on that too. So I'll get a little more detail on that and peg that down. We'll have that information for you. Um, so, uh, so can you pray for Brother Bill? Uh, Dave Resnick, uh, bone cancer is improving. He's back to work part time. Uh, continue to pray for him if you would. And uh, Michael Tatum, 
This is Louise Tatum's nephew. Uh, has lung cancer and given six months to live, and that was with chemo and radiation. So pray for uh, Louis, uh, or no, I'm sorry, Michael Tatum. So and this is Louis's Tatum's nephew, and he's at Johnson Willis Hospital. So pray for him, the family there. Uh, Donnie Barlow. Uh, he came home. He came home. Oh, did he? Oh, praise the Lord. Well, it's always good to hear a blessing. So that's, that's great. Uh, all right, Mary Bell and Curran, uh, she had mentioned that she's going to be having a biopsy on September 13th. So we'll be praying for her at 1.30. And um, she did make the mention that she does need a, has a transportation need there. So if anyone's able to help with that, do you know where she has to go? She didn't tell me as far as where the location was. But um, we can we can get that information from her. I imagine a like Cadillac might be moving. Could I go How does that go in this with the car situation? Well, one still in the shop and we got that go in the back and put it back in there every now and get that. For real. Uh, Kevin Best, uh, pray for Kevin and Renee as they're moving his aunt in to stay with them. Um, he, he came by the other day just to borrow a couple of tables, and um, uh, they're going to be having an estate sale and whatnot. And um, they're just, oh, pray for both of them. They're just kind of overwhelmed with it. And um, I know they're doing the right thing, and he knows they're doing the right thing, but I know they're, um, they've both got health issues too. So continue to pray for Kevin and for Renee. Um, and um, as as they do, as they're helping his aunt, ultimately. So be praying for them if you would. Uh, for Bonnie Davis, she's having uh, trouble with her back. Um, she mentioned on Sunday that she's still having some issues with that. So pray for Bonnie if you would. Uh, Rich Donahue Sr. is having, uh, they finally lined up his surgery that's going to be Tuesday, August 31st, but he goes in on the 30th on the, in the, uh, the night before uh, for that procedure on that Monday. So keep that in mind. So again, that's on August 31st. And that's been a long time coming, by the way. So I know I'm just trusting the Lord that will give him a better quality of life to uh, continue to pray for Evelyn. What, what is the next next class? That you're um, tomorrow. Tomorrow? They're Tuesday and Thursday of each week. Okay, Tuesday and Thursday. Okay. All right. And her is liking it as good as that one. Do you like it just as good as that one, sir? Because you were trying to have fun with my Take fun. Take care of us. <laughs> Get old. <laughs> <laughs> Moving right along. <laughs> um, Pray for uh, David Doggin. Um, we had, we had, had him in there, and he passed away. So we put that update there. That was Ray and Alice's friend that they had in. So be praying for their family, if you would. Continue to pray for uh, Donna and for her health with, um, with her left left arm and the pain that she's having there. And she's supposed to have an appointment in September. So be praying for Donna. Alan, did she, I mean, did she hurt the arm, or did just, I mean, she didn't, I mean, she didn't fall or nothing? She didn't, I don't think so. Like, just, just like, I don't know what it is, huh? I think it's just worn out. Yeah. So why I thought she's dealing with you, she got worn out. <laughs> worn out, didn't you? Um, is there, do you have an update on Sarah and Sadie? They're all. Medicine. Oh, for any of them. Wow. Praise the Lord. Amen. All right. Okay. Um, Jerry gave the update last week that um, Jason Hudson is 100% healed from the amputation. So, so that's a praise. Also, a comment on Frank and Penny. They took her home from rehab. 
She's having severe pain in her leg and on, on pain meds, and she's going to see a specialist uh, tomorrow. So be praying for Donna and Nat, if you would. I know she's, I'm sure, itching to be here. I know she loves yeah. being here with us, and so uh, continue to pray for Donna, if you would. Uh, be praying for um, Cheyenne. This is uh, Kevin Bess, uh, uncle's granddaughter. And uh, she's in critical care with a blood clot in her heart and lung. Uh, she came down with uh, COVID in the hospital, and one of her lungs has collapsed. And she's, she'll be in the hospital for at least two more weeks. So continue to pray for Cheyenne, if you would. And she's young, man. she? Mm -hmm. surgery on 9-1, so pray for this need coming up, and continue to pray for Sue and for her family, if you would, and um, the loss of Joe. Uh, continue to pray for, we got an update from John on Beth. Uh, Beth is still having issues with nausea. Her blood pressure has gone down to normal uh, pressure since she was removed from her blood pressure medicine, so that's <laughs> kind of a Normally, you take blood pressure medicine for, but um, anyway, but praise the Lord. I guess you can look at it that way that she doesn't have to take at least that medicine anymore. So continue to pray for her. And she's just got so many, so many health issues continually going on. So continue to pray for God. Does um, she still have all them animals? Yes. Because <laughs> I called and talked to her and she had the little birds were singing and all. I couldn't hold her up. Yeah. <laughs> I think that brought a lot on John, I mean, he's, I mean, trying to keep with them and all on that, but they pull them together, that's good, I said. But she she has a lot of little animals. Okay. <laughs> I think John's facing the zookeeper. <laughs> um, continue to pray for John, too, and um, for, uh, for his health. Uh, also, they gave this this a uh, note this past week for uh, Zachariah. This is Zachariah Rhodes there in the bulletin. Uh, fractured and dis the dislocated his collarbone in a school scrimmage football game his first day of school. So that's quite the how you do starting back. Uh, he had surgery already at the beginning of the week, and his surgery went well, and there was no complications. So thank the Lord for that. And this is John and Beth's oldest grandson. So continue to pray for Zachariah and for his healing, if you would. Um, <clears throat> I left a message for Barbara Robbins, but Terry talked to, to um, Barney, and uh, you want to give a little bit of an update, Terry? Yeah, I talked to Barney today, and <clears throat> just to ask how Barbara was doing, and he said that she was doing better.
Christina, I'm sorry. How do you say the first name of the next one? Inez Zuckerman. Okay. Um, broke, broke a leg in three places and is in physical therapy. This is Christina's co worker's stepmom. So pray for healing there. Side, uh, we did have, we still have there. Just continue to pray for Linda Griffith and their family, if you would. Um, also, as Linda's going to be getting in with um, her daughter, um, living with her daughter, so pray that that goes well. Um, that that will, you know, all you know, all that goes along with those things. So pray for them, if you would. On the very back of the bulletin. The main bullet, part of the bulletin. Um, we put there under the nation. Also, just pray for the Afghan believers and the U.S. citizens that are still trapped there in Afghanistan. So we're thankful just for you know. There's not a lot of there's not a lot of reports. I've been coming across some uh, from Samaritan's Purse and also Glenn Beck has put out that they've been having flights that or well, not him but sponsoring different flights in and out, uh, getting some of these Christians out of there. And um, so we're not hearing too much of that in the mainstream media, but we're thankful for that and how that some of these people have stepped up. And um, and so anyway, and so that's that's a blessing. So we're thankful for that. And uh, but continue to pray as this deadline narrows in too. And um, so all right. Anybody else have any other updates? Okay, Terry. Ask Terry. Ask Terry. Go ahead, Terry. I don't know what that is. <laughs> uh, a praise and a prayer request. Uh, <coughs> uh, Rick and Joshua made it all the way to Pensacola today without any difficulty. Um, so Joshua has to start back next week, but he has a lot to do between now and, and next Tuesday.
want to try as much as we can. And to hire them out so you can come over here. <laughs> what is it? So you had to hire them out so you can come over here. Oh, uh, but when we come over here, we get Portobello. <laughs> By the way, I just want to thank, um, I know, uh, Ken and Buddy and uh, Al and Terry and Dre, they all come and uh, uh, take care of the property. We're just thankful so much for that. But think about it. You know what? Now, I'm going to really think about it. I thought about it. Three of us is 240-year-old. That's a lower working because we couldn't do that when we went to the hotel. Yeah, yeah that's some determined. That's what I mean. I guarantee you, there many churches that ain't the Lord bless us to do it, and not on us, all of the people pulling in and pulling together. But in this church, is, it, you can see if you really stop how it's got to be the Lord because I've seen churches this size. And I talked to my neighbor, and he was like, and he was crying almost. They couldn't keep going, man. The age of the people, they couldn't keep. And the church is gone now, but I mean, somebody else took it over. I mean, so it, it, the Lord gives us enough strength. And I got a little teenage boy here kind of helping me. <laughs> that little boy, this flies my hyper. <laughs> Somebody's got to keep up with you, buddy. <laughs> All right, let's go ahead and have a word of prayer. And um, as we 